So, yes, uh, hi, everyone. I first just want to say that I'm incredibly happy and grateful to be here and, and share this talk with you. And uh, yeah, the talk today is called Threat Hunting DLL Injected C2 Beacons uh, Using Memory Forensics. And I'm Fawn. Oh, okay. And Shelby already mentioned this. I was going to mention it, but we can just skip. But yes, the show notes have been shared. I don't want you to worry about, uh, I'm going to be moving pretty fast, so I don't want you to be worrying about writing anything down or asking uh, what was the thing I mentioned later. Uh, you can find all the details there. It's waiting for you already. Um, and so what exactly is it that we're doing here today? Meaning, uh, why is it that I'm here sitting and talking to all of you? Um, well, I recently created a, a free hands-on threat hunting course uh, specifically for beginners. Um, and this isn't, I'm not selling anything here. Uh, like it says, it's a completely free course. Uh, there's no upsell, nothing. Uh, rather, it's really just an artifact of my own personal learning journey. Uh, I wanted to become better at threat hunting. And so I thought an uh, excellent thing uh, to do in, in, in this vein uh, would be to create a course on threat hunting. Um, and so I shared it online just uh, with the hope that it would be of value to uh, some other people. And so today we're here because we're going to explore part of this course, and I hope to inspire you to do the rest of the course and or even perhaps uh, inspire you to create your own course about something that uh, you'd like to know more about. Uh, and so in our brief time together today, um, but first off, we're going to explore some ideas. Uh, these will be ideas from the course, and it's also going to be just kind of like uh, threat hunting more broadly in general. Uh, and then towards the end, in the last five to 10 minutes, we'll actually do a practical demo directly from the course. Uh, sorry. All right. Um, so I thought an excellent place for us to start today uh, would be to return to the title. And I want to distill it down into it's kind of like four essential components. Uh, I want us to deconstruct each of these terms one by one. And then hopefully in the end, we can put everything we've learned together and we'll have a much better idea of uh, not only what this means, uh, like what this is, but also uh, why we do it. Uh, so starting with threat hunting, um, there's two things I want to answer about threat hunting. Uh, the first thing is, uh, what is threat hunting? And the second part is, uh, why do we do threat hunting? Before we get to that, uh, I want to just kind of like zoom out a bit more and define what I think of as at least one of kind of the uh, central problems of organizational cyber defense. But even before that, we're going to get a tiny bit philosophical for just like a minute and get super broad. I really want us to think about uh, what the act of security even is. And so to me, the act of security is a relationship. It's a relationship between two entities. It's a something to secure and someone that secures. And so if you apply this contextually to organizational cyber defense, uh, the something to secure, uh, well, that's obviously our network, right? Um, but it's not really the physical network. Uh, that's more the domain of the physical security guard. Um, rather, it's it's more something like uh, the informational integrity of the network. I think that's a better way of thinking of it, really. Um, and then in the case of someone that secures, um, in at this point, I'm just going to define that as a security operator. Uh, I don't, at this point, want us to get locked into any specific approaches or paradigms to security. Uh, let's just keep things as kind of like broad, generic as possible for now. So we have our network and we have our security operator. Uh, now, in order to secure, in order for this relationship to make sense, there's one thing that's required. Um, and that's the ability for the security operator to view the network. Um, and I want to be clear, I, I do include a visual view, um, but it's much more than that. Um, it's really any way in which uh, the security operator can uh, receive information and a kind of an updated feedback of information um, in order so for them to be able to observe and monitor. And this then will allow them to be able to detect whether or not a compromise has taken place. And so we have our security operator. He has the view kind of of the, net the network. Um, but at the same time, like I just said, they're not sitting there looking at the computers and the router and the cable. Uh, the security operator rather is looking at data. 
Uh, now, at the same time, it's not all data. It's not the organizational or application data. It's not really the uh, spreadsheets and the invoices and the emails of uh, the people on the network. Uh, rather, it's something like the security data is uh, what we can call it. Um, and the security data is kind of like a form of metadata. What it really is, is it's data about the network. And so for most of us, when we think about this, we can think of uh, you know a packet captures. Uh, we can think of the whole variety of different logs, whether that be host or network logs. Um, and I'm going to propose you might even make an argument that we can include in, in certain circumstances memory dumps in there as well. Uh, but here's the issue you see is the issue is if the security operator had to meaningfully try to process all the data generated by uh, all the security data generated by the network uh, well it will just kind of like completely freak them out obviously because it is a sisyphean task of the nth degree um, in plain english it's pretty much impossible for the security operator to meaningfully process all security data generated by the network and so this is what I propose. It's uh, useful for us to think of as at least one of the central problems of organizational cyber defense. Uh, I also like to think of it as it's a it's really it's a, a it's a case of data capacity incompatibility. It's much more being produced than can be uh, processed. So the security operator cannot process all security data in a meaningful manner to find potential threats. And so one way I think it's useful for us to think about a cyber defense strategy is actually how you go about solving this problem. In other words, how do we make an inaccessible amount of data accessible uh, so that we can efficiently find a threat? Um, so kind of like with this framing in mind, uh, let's look at some ways in which to solve this problem. I'm going to start with the conventional approach, the today's orthodoxy. Uh, I'm going to call it the Soxum approach or Soxum paradigm. Um, I'm obviously ve very well aware that uh, modern organizational cyber defense contains many more elements and complexity. Um, but I think for the moment, we can make an argument that these two are kind of at the logical core uh, of how much uh, how uh, modern organizational cyber defense operates. OK, so we have our something that needs to be secure. Uh, we have our in this case, our SOC analyst who needs to secure it. Uh, and he has his problem. He has the data capacity incompatibility. Uh, so how is this solved usually in a, in a SOC some paradigm? Uh, well, it's it's solved really by way of a filter. And uh, what this filter is, it's a outside in or an external filter. Um, and really, it is just a piece of code. And you can think of it as an algorithm or software. But at the end of the day, uh, it's an external artifact. It's something outside of the security operator themselves. Um, and it receives all the security data. And then based on its own internal locus and rules, it will then decide which tiny slither of a subset of this total amount of security data uh, to present to the security to the SOC analyst, and of course we know it's presented as alerts. And then the SOC analyst really does one thing mainly, and that is they react to the alerts. Um, and so I think it's also worth noticing here that when I spoke about the view before and the ability to view all the security data being generated by the network, and um, that essentially what we've done here is uh, we've dramatically reduced the the actual view of the SOC analyst. Um, to only that which the code, again, something outside of the operator themselves, have decided is worthy of their attention. Uh, I mention this here because I'm not going to fully explore this today, but I think what happens here in this reduction is very interesting because a lot of problems that I think of as blind spots in modern organizational cyber defense actually comes from this kind of reduction in view. Okay, so let's contrast this with the threat hunting approach. It's the same basic setup. Uh, we have our network producing security data. And this time we have our security operator who is a threat hunter, played here by the badass Sarah Connor. Uh, but she has the same problem, the problem of data capacity incompatibility. So how does Sarah Connor, our threat hunter, go about solving this problem? Uh, well, also with a filter. But the key difference here is the filter is inside out. It's an internal filter. And so I'm calling it your skills only because I couldn't really find one word that encompasses everything that I'm trying to say here, you know, but it's kind of a, the filter is kind of a product of her skills, her experience, her knowledge, what resources she has available. 
at any point in time, perhaps you receive some intel and she's looking for a specific type of malware, whatever methodology she's applying at any moment, that will kind of determine um, how the total subset of data is filtered down. And so because of this, the threat hunter is inherently proactive, meaning they go and search out the threat in situ, in, in the natural environment, and not in a reduced set. And so again, I just wanted to point out that the total scope uh, of security data is retained. Uh, this doesn't mean that the threat hunter at any moment is going to look at all the security data, uh, but it means that they potentially could look at all the security data at any moment. But then again, based on their specific method at any moment in time, they will decide how to reduce it into a, into a, a smaller amount that is accessible. So if we quickly if we quickly compare these two side to side, uh, we have our SOC SIM approach. Like I said, it's code mediated or externally filtered. Uh, it's inherently reactive, uh, and the total view has been reduced to a, a, a tiny subset. If we contrast this to our threat hunter, it's skill mediated, aka internally filtered. It's inherently proactive, going to look for the threat, uh, and the full scope is retained. Okay, so then. Uh, the way I've kind of like framed it and presented it here, uh, maybe it seems like I'm just trying to say that a threat hunter is a far superior and better version of the SOC analyst. Um, and of course, this is not what I'm trying to say at all. Uh, rather, it's as the wise Mr. Jimi Hendrix said, uh, different strokes for different folks. Um, and what I mean by that here is these are really two different solutions for two different problems. Um, and now to understand what I mean by two different problems, we have to uh, enter into our discussion one additional layer of abstraction, uh, specifically, <clears throat> sorry, as, it's, uh, as it pertains to the threat. Uh, so, so far, we've kind of implicitly been assuming uh, that all threats are the exact same of equal value. It's this kind of homogenous slop of threats out there. Um, but of course, all of us know that's not the case at all. Uh, there's many different ways in which we might go about categorizing threats. Um, one very popular way is, for example, with these categories. Most of us learn that kind of introductory cybersecurity. Um, but the important thing is here, it's, it's a quality decline. We're categorizing um, different attacks based on the perceived quality of them. And so I actually want to introduce the same idea, a quality decline, uh, but something even simpler. I want us to bifurcate threats into two categories only, uh, and we're going to call these low-value attacks and high-value attacks. Uh, so with low-value attacks, what I mean is uh, this is by far the bulk of the attacks out there, and that's because beyond the kind of initial little push that a human gives them, uh, they're mostly automated. It's mostly kind of like code expressing itself in a way. Um, because of this, because of the low input required, it's very cheap and it operates, uh, we could think of it as a kind of a shotgun or a spray and pray approach, uh, meaning any individual threat has an incredibly low probability of success, uh, but you can generate so many because they're so cheap. And so the product of this does always inevitably lead to successful threats. If we contrast this to high value threats, uh, these are often more targeted th uh, uh, threats. Uh, so it's typically a specific group of individuals targeting a specific organization. Uh, it's often human driven and also the humans involved are typically quite competent and quite skilled. And because of this it's expensive because of the high degree of uh, human in uh, investment that it has to, uh, that it requires. Sorry, um, but Though it makes up a, a tiny, a, a much smaller total amount of threats as compared to low value attacks, uh, it has a much higher, much higher probability of succeeding. And so bringing this back, connecting this to what is better, a SOC versus Threat Hunter, uh, what I'm really trying to say here is that uh, the SOC SIM approach is the better tool to deal with low value attacks. Uh, whereas threat hunting is the better tool to deal with high value attacks. So SOCSIM is a mostly automated solution for a mostly automated problem, whereas threat hunting is a mostly human driven solution for a mostly human driven problem. And so what is best? It depends. It depends on the organization and what are the main issues they're dealing. That's whatever is best. Cool, so moving ahead, uh, let's get to our next term, C2 beacons. 
Uh, but even broader than that, let's just talk about what C2 or command and control is. Uh, so I want us to get on the same page here by just using a very simple example. And so we have our victim system here. Uh, we have our attacker system. The attacker creates a spear phishing email, sends it to the victim. Uh, it contains, you know, urgent invoice 5000.docx. So they couldn't help themselves. They immediately opened it contained a embedded VBA macro, uh, which is basically just a stager. It goes out, it downloads another piece of malicious code from a web server, uh, and then it installs it on the victim system. The moment it's installed, the victim system calls back to the attacker system, uh, and it's established the connection. And so I know, I know that um, C2 frameworks are in, in nearly ineffably more complex than what I'm about to represent here. Um, but for now, I think for the purpose of today's talk, uh, we can really reduce things down to only these two elements uh, because this is really all we need to uh, really, uh, this is really all we need to focus on at this point. And so the malicious code that was installed on the victim system, uh, that is the C2 beacon, sometimes also called a C2 artifact or a C2 implant. Uh, but for now, let's stick with this uh, nomenclature. And then the system, the attacker system that it connected back to, uh, well, that's the C2 server. Uh, and I want to put special emphasis only on these two parts because these are the two halves that facilitate the C2 connection. And the C2 connection for us as threat hunters are incredibly important. And I'm going to circle back to this shortly. Okay, so now that we know what C2 beacons are, uh, what do I mean by DLL injected C2 beacons? Uh, well, as most of us hopefully know, DLL is just shared code. It's just a file containing a collection of uh, loosely related functions uh, that other processes can then call using the Windows API. So in any normal circumstance, uh, what we have would be legitimate processes accessing legitimate DLLs. In case of DLL injection, uh, what we have now are still legitimate processes. That hasn't changed. Um, but we enter into the population of DLLs, some malicious DLLs, and we basically force processes to execute them or to inject them into their memory space. And so standard DLL injection, just very briefly, it means we write a malicious DLL to, into disk. Uh, we inject that DLL into the memory space of a legitimate process. And the moment it is injected, it will execute itself, typically. And so now the question is why? Why do we do DLL injection? And uh, I really love this uh, concept or idea from evolutionary biology called the Red Queen effect, uh, which is based on this following line from uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Um, and so in evolutionary biology, just kind of like very briefly, um, how this is typically applied is to explain things like the co-evolutionary arms race between predator and prey. A super simple example. Let's say we have a population of uh, cheetahs and we have a population of gazelles. There's a random mutation in the population of cheetahs and their fast twitch fiber is now a little bit better. And so the cheetahs have become faster and thus more successful at hunting the gazelles. And so then we can uh, ask ourselves, well, does this mean the cheetahs are now so fast they're just going to hunt the gazelles to extinction? And most of us intuitively know that's not the case. Uh, and the reason it's not the case is because the moment the cheetahs become faster, uh, they themselves now are the selective pressure and they're selecting for faster gazelles. Uh, so within a few generations, what ends up happening is we now have faster gazelles and some state of equilibrium or homeostasis has once again been reached. And so it says it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And why do we say that is because we now have faster cheetahs and faster gazelles. Um, and at the same time, the relationship between them is uh, virtually unchanged. And I like this idea. And I think it's an interesting lens to also apply if we look at the relationship between attackers and defenders. Uh, one specific, there's many examples, but I think one very interesting uh, specific uh, place is on the level of the process. Uh, evilbackdoor.exe is obviously a tiny little bit uh, tongue in cheek. Uh, you know, maybe they weren't that cheeky with naming them their malware. Uh, at the same time, it wasn't that long ago uh, that it was pretty easy for malware to hide on the level of uh, the process. And then as we became better at finding malware at the level of the process um, and, and preventing it, 
we acted as a selective pressure on the population of attackers and they innovated. And so one of the ways we might think that they innovated, obviously a good example would be, for instance, the living off the lands paradigm. And another way is with things like DLL injection. Because DLL injection, what it is, is a disguise. Um, it's an ability for malicious code to basically wrap itself in the cloak of a legitimate process. Um, and it does that by way, basically by proxy of not presenting itself as a process, but presenting itself as a DLL, which is injected into um, a uh, legitimate process. Cool. I, I'm seeing a lot of uh, smiley emojis. I'm glad you guys enjoyed that meme. <laughs> So uh, DLL injected. So let's move ahead to memory forensics. Um, and so with memory forensics, I don't really want to discuss the whole giant discipline uh, in and of itself. It's a whole monolithic uh, discipline by itself. Uh, rather, I think it's interesting for us now to explore the relationship between uh, memory forensics and threat hunting. And so I want to propose to you uh, what I think of as an approach to threat hunting. Um, and I'm very careful with my words here. It's an approach, not the approach. And the reason it's not the approach is because uh, threat hunting, the way it happens at any moment, is contingent upon a litany of different, of a whole host of variables, uh, which many of which are dynamic in and of themselves. Uh, what I'm trying to say is threat hunting can assume many different forms, and most of it is always contextually based. And also, if there was the approach, what is implied there is it can be codified. And if something can be codified, it means we can write software to do it better. Uh, and if it's software doing it, I also don't necessarily think of it as pure pure threat hunting anymore. So an approach to threat hunting that consists itself of three other components in this order, it would be network analysis, memory forensics, and log analysis. And so why, why these three approaches and why in this order? Well, remember earlier when I kind of put some emphasis on the C2 beacon and the C2 server, I said I want us to really pay attention to these because they facilitate the C2 connection. And so why is the C2 connection so important? Well, I want to propose that one way we can think of C2, uh, if we strip away all the complexity and nuance and all the layers of abstraction, and boil it down to its essential prima materia, uh, what we're basically left with is a connection. So I think one useful way to even think of C2 is C2 is a connection. That should not be. C2 is an unsolicited connection between a, a computer a system on your network and some external system. And so it then logically follows that if C2 is a connection, that to find C2, we need to find the connection. And probably in the most circumstances, the best tool for us to find a connection is through network analysis. Now, uh, through network analysis. So we can use tools like T-Shark and Wireshark and Zeek, Rita and AC Hunter and all the other amazing tools made by our friends at Active Countermeasures over here. And we can use this to hopefully find some suspicious connection. Now, once we've found a suspicious connection, almost the next most logical question would be, what is the process responsible for mediating that connection? And as network analysis is most of the time, the best tool to find a suspicious connection. So to elucidate the process, most of the time, the best uh, tool would be memory forensics. Now, once we've looked at the connection of the process, we might have other kind of secondary questions, right? Other IOCs we're interested in, registry key changes, new users, priv-esque, cred dumping, etc. And so in this case, to find these other IOCs or you know secondary IOCs, most of the time, the best tool for that uh, would be to use log analysis. And so today, what we're going to simulate is we found a suspicious connection. Now we want to find out more about the process mediating that connection. And that's why today we're going to be focused on memory forensics. Cool. So I've kind of broken the whole title down right now. I hope we all have a much better idea of uh, what, what I'm talking about and why we're doing this. Uh, and so we can put everything kind of back together. And so today we're threat hunting DLL injected C2 beacons using memory forensics and specifically using something called Process Hacker. And we're going to use Process Hacker to try to find five different diagnostic indicators. Uh, so let's go through these quickly. 
The first thing would be parent-child relationship. And so all of us know that processes can spawn processes, and in turn, those processes can go ahead and spawn processes. And this kind of leads to a family tree, which we typically call the process tree, right? And now, because of what I said about the red queen effect earlier, um, processes in isolation, since malware doesn't necessarily hide on the level of the process so openly anymore, uh, just looking at processes in isolation is really not that interesting to us anymore. Uh, rather, it's more the, the subtext or the meta message we get when we look at the relationship between different processes uh, that are interesting to us. And so here's a great example. Uh, if we look at that, every single process on that list is a legitimate process. Uh, so if you had to go through each, through each one by one uh, in isolation, you wouldn't learn anything. But if we start looking in this pink box, uh, a number of things are going to jump out at us as being uh, quite strange. Uh, the first thing is we have WMI spawning PowerShell. Um, now, if it was the other way around, it wouldn't be that unusual. Um, but if we see WMI spawning PowerShell on a typical organizational network, on a typical user system, uh, it's certainly something that's a little bit unusual um, and is most of the time associated with uh, WMI-based attacks. Uh, we also see two instances of PowerShell spawning PowerShell. Again, let's assume this is not a sysadmins uh, system. This is a regular user system. Uh, usually what that means is an encoded PowerShell has been run. And so we'd certainly want to know, uh, want to follow up and understand uh, what happened there, why this occurred. And then probably the most interesting example, I think, is this one. And it's because it not only is suspicious, um, but it's almost a a kind of a, a fingerprint in and of itself too, uh, because it even implicates the kind of malware that's involved, in this case being uh, Cobalt Strike. Uh, now, Cobalt Strike likes to create what's called sacrificial processes. We can see that PowerShell spawned multiple copies of the same process, uh, run dll32.exe. Um, and now it spawned these multiple copies ultimately really for redundancy, so that when a process dies, it has a backup processes ready. Uh, and it's run DLL32.dxe specifically uh, for the sole reason that that's actually just the default settings for Cobalt Strike. Uh, you can change it in the config, uh, but it actually turns out that most attackers, or uh, let's say almost half of attackers, don't even bother changing that, uh, which I think is actually just a reflection of how poor perhaps we still are at detecting it. And so the next one is we want to look at the current directory. Um, kind of like same vein as before, there's no absolute directory that indicates to us something is bad. There's not a C Windows evil. Um, rather, we again have to interpret the relationship between a process and its directory. And so here we see obviously a legitimate process called SVC host. Um, and that is the directory we would expect it to see it running from. Uh, now, if we saw this, again, SVC host is a legitimate uh, process and C Windows temp is a totally legitimate directory. Um, but if we saw SVC host being run from C Windows temp, it would definitely be something uh, we should at least be a tiny bit concerned about and, and follow up on. Oh, why did that happen? Um, can everyone still hear me? Yes. Can we hear can you hear you, we just can't camera. see you. Yeah, sorry, I don't know why. Okay, cool. Whoa, I'm getting an avalanche of thumbs up. Thanks, guys. Woo. Okay, so everything is good again? Yes, you're good to go. Perfect. So let's move on to our third indicator, uh, which would be command line arguments. So let's just, uh, I'm going to explain what I mean here by way of an example. Uh, if we were to run this following uh, wmic uh, command line, uh, it's basically going to tell us what command line was used to invoke the process with PID 4343. Uh, now imagine we get this as a result, right? So basically it's telling us that run dll32.exe was spawned or invoked at command line simply kind of in a nude way, right? Sans argument. Um, now, if we didn't know what run dll32.exe was, this might not seem that unusual to us because it's really not that unusual for uh, you know, processes to be spawned without arguments. However, run dll specifically has one task, and it's to invoke functions from dlls. And because of that, uh, we would expect it to be run like this, because if we want to invoke a function from a dll, 
it logically follows we have to tell it what function and what dll we want uh, it to, to use right and so if it's run without these arguments the best way to think of it is just it doesn't make sense in context of what this process is supposed to do it doesn't make sense that the arguments weren't provided and again this is then something that we'd want to dig into deeper uh, memory permissions uh, so if we see a memory permissions uh, space with a protection here we can see in pink rwx it means read write execute right uh, this is just indicating that basically this code was written to memory and immediately executed and in terms of legitimate processes it's not completely unheard of um, but it's actually pretty rare for that to happen and so if we saw that um, it usually indicates to us that um, there's probably malware involved. Uh, now, something I do want to mention is this is the simplest example, and malware authors have already innovated quite a lot to uh, not be this obvious. Um, but for today, we're just going to stick with the kind of most elementary examples. And the final fifth indicator is um, if we do see such a space with anomalous permissions, um, we immediately want to look at the actual memory content of that memory space. Uh, specifically, we want to see if it contains a PE file. And so for those of you that don't know, a PE file is just the structure of an executable file in Windows, and that includes malware. Uh, so there's two specific things we'd want to be on the lookout for. Uh, so here I just have like a truncated version really of a PE file structure. And the first thing we'd want to look for are the initial bytes, uh, which is termed the magic bytes. Uh, this isn't unique to PE files. All files have um, magic bytes. It's really what you can think of it as, of as it's a way for code to communicate to whatever is reading that code, uh, what kind of file it is. And so in the case of a PE file, we'd want to look for the presence of um, the characters MZ or the hex 4D5A. And then right below that in the DOS tab, um, this I think of as a vestigial string. Uh, this string is from a time where some systems actually only had DOS. Um, that's probably quite rare these days in uh, 2023. Um, at the same time, the actual string has been retained in the PE file structure. And so it's useful for us in this case because it helps indicate to us that it is actually a PE file that we're dealing with. Okay, cool. So we're just about ready for our practical demo. Uh, just one thing is I actually performed the attack myself quickly before class. Um, and I just want us to get on the same page with what exactly I did uh, so that we know what it is we're actually looking at. Um, I do want to mention that if you do the course yourself, you're going to do uh, the attack yourself too. Uh, and so the first thing is we have a, a victim VM, which is a Windows 10 VM, and we have an attacker VM, which is a Kali VM. Uh, on the attacker system, I generated a payload using MSA Venom. And what it really is, it's just a malicious DLL. That's a piece of code that's going to call back and establish a connection to a handler. Speaking of, the next thing we'll do is then create our interpreter handler, which would receive the callback once the code is executed on the victim system. And then we transfer the payload. And now I cheated. I just created a Python server and allowed myself to transfer the malicious uh, DLL over to the victim system. Uh, but in a real world scenario, this is probably a closer example of what you'd expect to happen as the same as the example we used earlier. And so next, we're going to inject a PowerShell script into the memory of the victim system. Now, this specific script is from a, a, a framework called PowerSploit. And we can, for example, run an IEX command. And there where it says script in green, uh, we would actually specify a FQDN or an IP and the name of a PowerShell script. And this command is just going to go, it's going to download that script, and it's going to inject it directly into memory. So now at this point, we basically have all our pieces uh, in place. And the only thing we need to do is we just run the script that we just injected into memory. We can see it there in pink. And we uh, specify two things. We specify the PID of the legitimate process we want to inject into. Uh, and we also uh, specify the actual location of the malicious DLL. And then once we've done that, we should uh, have our shell. Yeah, Dimitri. Just gotta enjoy a celebration. <laughs> okay, cool. 
So guys, uh, that's really about it. Uh, we can go ahead, but I do not want to give you the appearance that as a threat hunter, we're just going to open Process Hacker and, wow, well, we just find the malicious process. Um, as I explained in an approach, it's usually preceded with finding a suspicious connection. Uh, so imagine I perform that attack and on the victim system, we then run this following command and it basically shows there's a connection to an external IP. Uh, we can't make, there's no business use case for connecting to that external IP. We don't see the external IP being to connected to on from any other system on this network. Um, and at the same time, we see that actually, lo and behold, uh, this connection is being mediated by run dll32.exe, uh, which, as I explained what its function was before, again, it just doesn't really make sense to us. Why is this involved in establishing a connection to an external IP? Cool. And with that, uh, we can quickly jump into our victim VM and process hacker and uh, look at the five diagnostic indicators. Cool. So I'm assuming everyone can see the VM. Can I get a thumbs up? Cool. All right. Great. Thanks, guys. Very responsive. And uh, so we'll run this as admin. And we can go down here. And we can see, you know, we're obviously going to have to search for run DLL, or we could use the PID, which we could find two from um, PowerShell. Um, but we see there it is. And so we can see that run DLL, oh, the first thing we look, up, uh, look for, of course, is the parent-child relationships, right? Um, we can see that run DLL was spawned by Rufus. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, uh, Rufus is just a... A, a tiny bit of software, a tiny piece of software that creates bootable thumb drives. And so for whatever reason, in this scenario, this is the process that the attacker decided to inject into. And now to me, this doesn't immediately make sense. Why does a process, uh, why does a piece of software that needs to create bootable thumb drives uh, require to spawn run DLL32.exe? Certainly a bit strange, but at the same time, I don't profess to be an expert on Rufus or exactly how it was written. Um, so, you know, that's perhaps something we just want to look into more. Um, but then we see run DLL32 spawn a, a, a command shell. Um, yeah, that definitely shouldn't happen. And that is certainly something that uh, we probably just want to call the DFIR cavalry straight away. Uh, it's actually because, uh, sorry, I didn't mention, but I did drop a shell from my interpreter handler. And so in this case, we definitely see some parent-child relationships uh, that should give us a, at least a little bit of cause for concern. Okay, so let's dig in deeper. I'm going to double click on run dll32.dxe. So it's gonna open it up. I'll head over to general. And so here we can see the command line. And as I showed in my example, um, we would not expect run dll32.exe to be run without at least the arguments explaining what function and what dll it uh, wants to invoke. Um, and so in this case, uh, you know, th this is suspicious to us. Uh, current directory, it says desktop. And the reason for that is um, in injected into Rufus and Rufus actually exists on my desktop. Uh, so this will obviously vary depending on where the attacker decided to, to inject um, the malware into. Um, but if that process doesn't exist in Windows uh, System 32, uh, which is where we would expect a run DLL to exist, um, as we can see right there, uh, if, if, if it deviates from that, again, this is certainly something we'd uh, want to look into deeper. And next, I'll head over to the memory tab. I'm going to click protection, which is going to sort the protections. And now we can just scroll down and we can see whether or not there are RWX permissions. And indeed, we see we have two instances of RWX permissions, uh, which again, as I explained, uh, is usually pretty indicative of this being malware. A final thing is I can double click on this and it'll open that and we can actually read the contents of that memory space. And lo and behold, I see the magic bytes, MZ. And I also see the vestigial string. Uh, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. So this indicates to me pretty clearly uh, that what we're dealing with here uh, is a PE file. Okay, guys, and that's really all there is uh, to it today. I wanted to keep things kind of very brief. Uh, this is obviously a a tiny smidgen or a representation of the entire course, um, but just enough for us to get through to today and hopefully digest uh, mentally. And so, yes, like I said, uh, on my website, 
you know, the entire course uh, also includes you setting up all the, the entire virtualized network yourself, uh, performing the entire attack yourself, and then doing the threat hunting. I'm a really big fan of, uh, for lack of a better word, like a holistic approach. I think as a defender, we are so much better uh, when the attack isn't an abstract thing, uh, but it's something we did ourselves and that we understand and can intuit. And so if you were interested in doing the rest of the course, it's uh, on my website right there, um, fonross.com. Um, also, you can find me at all these places, and I'm always uh, just fonross, so you can find me there. Uh, if you were perhaps inspired uh, to follow me, uh, I'm pretty much now full-time committed myself to creating more of these hands-on threat hunting C2 courses. Uh, we'll obviously explore different components and different approaches, and I also want to look at uh, different frameworks. Um, but that's definitely what you can expect uh, to find if you follow me there. Just lots of hands-on self-teaching threat hunting courses. Um, on my website are written components. And then uh, pretty soon, I'll also start uh, adding video components to all the courses uh, on my YouTube channel. It's probably worth mentioning, I already have a few videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, they're just CTF walkthroughs and Python scripts. Um, this is kind of like a relic from when I was still trying to find my groove uh, or whatever. Uh, but for now, you can rest assured what I'm going to be focusing on full time is uh, threat hunting C2. And later on, I'll also add a bit of uh, deception in there too. And so I just wanted to take this moment to say a big uh, kind, a big shout out and thank you to uh, Chris and Bill and Shelby and uh, Casey and everyone else at Active Countermeasures for giving me this opportunity. I also want to say a huge thank you to all of you guys. Um, this is the first ever time I've done a talk or a lecture in this specific domain in uh, cybersecurity. Um, so it's, it's really very special for me and I'm very grateful to be able to have uh, shared it with all of you. And then just the last thing, um, the the person that was most uh, excited to uh, attend today's talk, unfortunately, couldn't make it. And uh, so I just wanted to dedicate this talk uh, in to the memory of my dad. Yeah. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. So we had a couple pop up while you were talking uh, that yeah. I thought were kind of cool. Uh, one of them was in SOC analysis, memory analysis would be something we don't look at often or more of an incidence thing? Um, I think in terms of a SOC, it would definitely be more of an incidence thing. You know, and it also depends. Obviously, when I'm having this discussion and I'm reducing things to a model and say a SOC does this and doesn't do that, I'm stripping away all nuance, right? There's obviously exceptions and the way an actual SOC works in reality can manifest in a myriad of different ways. Um, but essentially a SOC to me, when I boil it down to its simplest thing, it receives an alert, it decides false positive. If it's a false positive, it might uh, you know, improve the rule sets to reduce the future likelihood of a false positive. Uh, and if it is an uh, actual threat, it would a SOC would then immediately alert uh, the DFIR because they're more specialized to do that. Um, and so it's from, it's interesting to me. I, I didn't have the time to include this, and I would love to do a video on my YouTube about it. Uh, but it's very interesting, I think, the relationship between a threat hunter and the SOC and the DFIR um, and how the relationship kind of exists between the two. Uh, the, the threat hunter to me has the same kind of goal as the SOC, which is just to find the threat, right? Uh, but the threat hunter almost uses more the toolbox and the methodology and the mindset um, of DFIR. Yeah, yeah, yeah great point. Um, th so I thought this was an important one. Would it be yeah. fair then to assume that with such much malicious codes that it's difficult to maintain persistence since reboot wipes the process and has to establish itself again? Back to square one, so to speak. Uh, well, there are obviously um, other more sophisticated ways of you know threat hunters, uh, so not threat hunters, but threat actors uh, establishing persistence. 
uh, you know, so there's a variety of ways in which backdoors can create it or uh, service or registry changes and all those things uh, that would ensure that persistence. So, uh, again, there's there are many exceptions to this rule, but, uh, you know, I, I reduce things down today to creating the connection. Uh, but most often, probably one of the first things that a threat actor would do is uh, create not one, but multiple avenues to ensure that were they to lose that connection, uh, it could be uh, achieved again. Yeah, um, so, reboots sometimes fix problems. They don't necessarily fix infections. I think it's important for everybody to remember. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Curious what you would do if you wanted to search all of memory space for a specific pattern. I believe Yara is effective uh, yeah. at this on live streams. Uh, is there another approach or option? Uh, so to be honest, this is uh, definitely reaching the limit of my expertise. Um, you know, I included there looking for the memory space for MZ and the vestigial string. Um, but certainly the next thing you would do would be to use, uh, uh, I don't know if it was in the comment or Chris, this was your uh, comment, but to use Yara rules. And the, the cool thing there is as well, you would not only look for, uh, is this a PE file, uh, but Yara rules would also help you to actually ascertain uh, what specific malware uh, you're dealing with, because uh, some of the strings would uh, differ between uh, the different types of malware, of course. Yeah, yeah. Me memory can be tough to go through. I mean, you can get as simple as just, you know, write it out to a file, mount it and search it but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to find anything um, attackers have also gotten really good at um, hiding uh, hiding and obfuscating their stuff uh, yeah. i think it was four or five years ago we ran across some malware that actually looked for you doing a memory dump it looked for you know, yeah because most most reads to memory are random but when it started seeing sequential pattern memory reads, oh, let me take the evil stuff, write it to disk temporarily, wait for that process to finish, and now I'll load myself back up in memory again. So uh, attackers definitely have a lot of different techniques they can pull. Yeah, it's it's probably also worth adding. I uh, just again, in the interest of time, didn't go through it, uh, you know. But I kind of presented it here, making it seem like if it's malware, you open it, there will be a PE file. Um, yes. But as Chris said, yeah. there's many ways of getting around it. A common way is header stomping. It's there's uh, Chris. Uh, you have one of my favorite lines, uh, like philosophically in this field, which is uh, malware doesn't break the rules, but it bends it. Yeah. Right. So we say, well, a PE file has to have that, but nobody enforces mm -hmm. that. Rules. Yeah, so exactly. It does. Malware it? can really? bend that rule. <laughs> yeah. yep. so, so malware can bend that rule. Um, Obviously, guys, what I what I represented here was, let's say, the you know first example introduction to this world, and from there, now you have kind of a some level of chart of the terrain, but the complexity and the nuance yes. is an endless rabbit hole. You know, it, exactly. You I think I think the analogy is here is the rabbit hole. You can see it yeah. here, and you're shining a flashlight Perfect. down a little bit. That doesn't mean it isn't a thousand feet deep. Yeah, and just exactly. what you see at the first six inches doesn't necessarily describe everything going down those thousand feet, but you got to start somewhere. So, yeah. Cool. Shelby, Bill, Keith, KC, anybody got anything else they want to add in? Besides happy birthday, Shelby, again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely happy birthday, Shelby. But that yes, was happy fantastic. Birthday. Um, so thank you very much. Really, that was it was said in such a way that it was so easy to understand. And I always appreciate yeah. that. So, yep. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah and there was a lot of comments yeah. along those lines in discord. I kept trying to tell everybody they were wrong, but yeah, no, they decided they liked it. So, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely going to watch this again. Fun. This was awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah Thanks so much. Absolutely. Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Fawn, we of... did have a question from one of the attendees. Uh, yes. How would you look for connections with long sleep timers? Um, and he says reference uh, netstat anob, but I think that's more. Uh, yes, no, actually, so that's... yeah, sorry, Bill. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, oh, yes, I, I, you know, I just use netstat anob as an example. Um, th this would have worked in this case, obviously, because we were dealing with Meterpreter, uh, you know, which isn't tr actually truly a beacon, even to be honest with the beacon, there's some asynchronous inter intermittent connection. Um, but the best way to find those things, uh, you know, I would never uh, necessarily teach a class on network threat hunting, telling you to net use NETS that NOB. 
you would use things like Rita and AC Hunter to find those things, right? That, that's really yeah. the, the simplest answer I can give you. Yeah. Cool, cool. Awesome. I think we're done. Awesome. So I, I guess I can stop the screen share at this point. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I yeah, think we, we're done. We definitely got a lot of positive feedback in um, both chats. Uh, so oh, thank nice. you again, Fawn, for joining us. Which means know, we'll have to have him back. Right? Yeah. And I know um, so Chris kind of touched on this before we started the presentation yeah. as well, but I did want to reiterate um, one of the things that Chris, you actually talked about in a webcast we did, I think last year about um, starting a career in threat hunting yep. is that while you're learning the best way to get involved with the community and really start making a name for yourself in the community is to share what you're learning via blogs or, you know, YouTube videos or whatever it is you can do. And that is how Fawn ended up here with us today is because yeah. he started That's learning right. and started making these videos and decided to create a free training for threat hunting. And, you know, Chris and the team thought it was awesome and wanted to give him a chance to share it with our larger community. Yeah. And just to so. level set again, Fawn, when did you start your cybersecurity journey? Um, today, one <laughs> year and one week to the day. <laughs> 19th, wow. I literally, I, I wrote a contract to myself promising that this is what I'm going to be committed not to. And yeah, it's been, <laughs> that's awesome. An amazing yes. journey. Yes. Right. But, what, but what spawned all of this was his uh, drive to not just learn it, but to share it with others. And I can't remember if we had this conversation before or after the cameras went on, but you really learn this in depth, trying to teach it to others. Yeah. So, you know, part of this, part of wanting to do this was just that, you know, Fon seemed cool and he had a really cool course, but part of it was also, you know, you folks can do this too. And we need more of this in the community. Oh, yes. Yeah. And um, ACM does also have a blog uh, a guest blog program. So yep. if you need somewhere to share the things you've learned and don't have your own website or something yet, um, feel free to share it with us. Um, but Fawn, I'm definitely looking forward to see all the amazing things that you do moving forward as well. So yeah. Of yeah, and, and we know you can't make it this year, but you got a free invite to Wild West Hack and Fest next year. Yes. So. hundred percent there. It really awesome. can't, wait, can't wait to meet all of you guys in person and hang out and you know, also just thanks again to you guys and your community. That's kind of like what makes me love this world, the cybersecurity realm so much is like you, you guys are like tr truly inspirational, uh, not just because you guys like kick ass and are badass at what you do, but you're just really awesome humans. I'm like, man, these people exist here and I can be in this industry. It's like, that's what I want to do for sure. So yeah, uh, thanks. So, to you. so last question for you, Fon. Will this yeah. series continue? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so the next one that I'm going to do would be a, a network analysis course. And like, uh, like I told uh, people, uh, this is what I do full time. I'm just going to be creating these courses full time. So when I wake up in the morning, th this is my quote unquote career right now. Um, and I actually have like a one year vision. I don't want to get too far myself and share my grand vision. Um, but in this line, in this lane or realm of self-teaching frameworks for threat hunting, specifically C2, um, you know, this is all to me culminating in kind of a big project that I want to share out there. Uh, and another thing I wanted to mention, if there are other people out there that uh, are interested in uh, what I'm doing and want to be involved in it somehow, uh, you know, uh, please, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. I would love to collaborate and work with other people. Um, and again, if you think, uh, you know, if you feel some imposter syndrome going there, I, I honestly didn't start studying threat hunting until May, right? So I have a few months of threat hunting experience under my belt. Uh, so please don't think you don't know enough to start. Um, you will know more by starting. That's the thing. There's this weird catch 22 where you think you can start because you're not good enough. You just start really. A, a lot you of times it's, a, a lot of times it's your point of reference, right? It, yeah. It's not that you've, you know, it's not, Fun. It's not that you know something that like, you know, John Strand doesn't know. It's that you have a way of interpreting the data that's going to align with other people and make their journey easier. And that's really what it's all about. So absolutely. And that, that's where I think a lot of our kind of give, like our own individual gifts come to is 
like uh, Chris said, you know, it's, there's not a linear competition. We have different ways of interpreting and viewing and communicating and sharing it. And your message and your way of presenting it might land better for some people and not as good for, for other people, you know, but in this way, we kind of like find our, um, there's an excellent book on anyone interested in kind of this thing called a tribe by a marketer named Seth Godin. And it's really all about like putting yourself out there, being authentic, because you're going to attract the people that you want yeah. in your tribe. And then you're automatically going to push the people away that you don't want in your tribe. And that's good too. You know, it's yes. like, it's like connecting and finding our, our tribes really. Yes. The ones with hate are usually not ones playing the game anyway. So who cares? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I got another one. So I'm going to have to fly. Awesome. Good. Well, Great. Um, just a couple of final notes for um, all of our attendees, because uh, I've seen some questions being asked. Yes, this whole webcast was recorded. So if you need to um, take some time to process and watch it again, you can definitely do so. Um, it's currently on our YouTube. If you look in the live section of our YouTube channel, you will find it. Um, Fawn was nice enough to create a whole show notes webpage on his website. So make sure you go check that out. Um, also, you'll find links on his website to his YouTube channel and anywhere else you can connect with him. Um, also, if you're attending through Zoom uh, live right now, you will receive a certificate of attendance for today that you can use for CPE and other credits. Um, and that will show up within about 24 hours to the, whatever uh, email address you use to register for this training. But with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Fawn, um, one last time, thank you so much for joining us. And hopefully Thanks, we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your birthday. Thanks, Fawn. Thank you. Happy birthday, <laughs> Shelby. Yeah. Thanks. Happy birthday, Shelby. Have a great day. See you guys around. Thanks again, Fawn. That was Bye. awesome. Cheers.